All right. Uh, the third technology that we will be talking about today is cardiac MRI, the ultimate diagnostic tool. Always the cardiac MRI people want said this is the ultimate, right? And, uh, and to talk to us about cardiac MRI is Dr. Eric Yang. He's our uh, guru in cardiac MRI, uh, our junior faculty who's dedicated quite a bit of his time also to research in cardiac MRI. So Eric, the floor is yours to tell us about cardiac MRI. Thank you for the kind introduction, Dr. Zaki. Just briefly, uh, I do want to mention I am going to be talking about uh, uh, off-label use of gadolinium contrast for cardiac imaging. And regarding cardiac MRI, um, I will just want to give you a broad overview of what the technology is capable of and what it has to offer in terms of cardiac assessment. Um, I won't go into the nitty-gritty uh, details of like pulse sequences and what have you, because uh, um, I, I can imagine I, that would bore quite a few of you to tears. For those who are interested, I do want to advertise we do an annual CMR workshop, and I invite you to attend that if you, if you really want to look under the hood. So I'm going to go over a brief overview of techniques, looking uh, specifically at uh, what it can offer morphologically, uh, talk about volumetric and flow velocity quantification techniques, and also talk about uh, late gadolinium enhancement imaging techniques, and then briefly go over uh, tissue characterization. So the nice thing about CMR is that we can look at anything in any plane we want. So we can go through and reproduce uh, the, uh, the cardiac views uh, that you uh, uh, became familiar with with uh, Dr. Zogby's talk. And uh, so we can look at uh, four, three, two chambers and short axis views as well. We can also acquire static 3D data sets, and this allows us to then take things offline and then manipulate the data to look at, uh, look at the entire anatomy of the patient and, and look for uh, additional uh, uh, issues that may be going on. In terms of uh, mor morphologic assessment, uh, it has a lot to offer, because often in the, uh, what happens is that uh, um, these patients will undergo an echocardiogram or uh, some other cardiac imaging, and there'll be a question as to whether or not uh, there's hypertrophy or, or questions about function or question about uh, 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 RV uh, function or uh, tribulations in king LV non-compactions. So that does bring back one very important point that uh, Dr. Zogby emphasized and I want to bring back. Cardiac uh, echo is usually the first line imaging for most assessments of, uh, of cardiac issues, but then uh, when questions still remain, other imaging modalities step in and uh, uh, cardiac MRI uh, then offers uh, the ability to look at various things. As you can see in the upper left, we can uh, look at um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy uh, associated with asymmetric septal hypertrophy. This lets us see whether or not there's a systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve. As you can see, the ant um, anterior leaflet of the mitral valve is being uh, pulled forward, leading to a, a posterior eccentric, uh, and, um, eccentric mitral regurgitant jet. There's also a dynamic LVOT obstruction, and that can all be seen on this uh, nice three-chamber uh, view of the heart. Um, there's also questions of whether or not the patient has apical hypertrophy, and as you can see in the bottom left, uh, there's uh, evidence of big thickening and also outpouching in the apex, and this is not some, something uncommon we, we find being referred to the cardiac MRI lab, lab for further assessment. Of course, we can also see uh, uh, morphology and function indicating dilated cardiomyopathy as well, um, as you can see in the middle, uh, middle top. And in the, in the bottom, a very common referral for patients with unexplained syncope or, or concern of uh, sudden cardiac death in the family or uh, unexplained VTV fib, these patients will come for arrhythmogenic uh, RV cardiomyopathy assessment. So this is an example here showing um, uh, akinesis, uh, dyskinesis of the RV apex, um, which is one of the diagnostic criteria, the others being a decreased uh, um, RV function and dilated RV. Last but not least, uh, we can see uh, trabeculations uh, very well in, in uh, cardiac MRI, and so we can use this to diagnose LV non-compaction. Another uh, big use of cardiac MRI is for congenital assessments. So often there's a question about, uh, about the uh, uh, area of the def uh, congenital defects, and so we uh, are often uh, called upon, um, have patients referred to us to look at uh, uh, atrial septal defects, muscular ventricular septal defects, other uh, defects of uh, the simple, simple congenital heart disease kind. And of course, uh, we also help uh, our colleague, Dr. Huey Lin, here a lot with a very congen complex congenital heart disease. Shown here is an example uh, in the upper right of a transposition of the great arteries. And um, these kind of patients remain a challenge from the echocardiographic standpoint. And so that's why these patients often uh, come to us for further assessment. 
We are capable of looking at uh, uh, coronaries as well, but not to the degree of uh, cardiac CT uh, that uh, Dr. Bamarian uh, just presented. We do acknowledge the spatial resolution is a bit superior um, using cardiac CT, and so uh, uh, that which should be a preferred modality, non-invasive modality for uh, ass assessing uh, uh, coronaries, although we can see it too. Uh, and there are people actively researching that as well. Um, but in terms of the strength of cardiac MRI, the biggest strength is looking at uh, volume and flow quantifications. And for that, I'd like to present to you as a 58-year-old gentleman with a mitral valve prolapse uh, who was referred to us for quantification of his, uh, of his mitral regurgitation. He underwent an echocardiogram, and there was qu a question of uh, what the severity was. Uh, this, this patient uh, was characterized as ha having at least moderate. And so as you can see, there's a very eccentric uh, posteriorly directed jet, uh, which makes it uh, very difficult to determine uh, parameters uh, to quantify for, by, by echo. Uh, as I demonstrated with a morphologic assessment, we can do different scan planes and see the involvement of the bileaflet prolapse. And as you can see, this is involving all parts of the mitral valve. And what I'm going to be showing next is a uh, 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 synase uh, showing a short axis stacks uh, by which we can then measure the volume in and diastole and in systole. Uh, unlike echo, we make no geometric assumptions about, uh, about the heart. And so we're able to actually trace the area um, on, on, on a, a short axis cross sections and then sum these in a stack to get uh, very accurate uh, end diastolic volumes, end diastolic volumes and, and systolic volumes and thus be able to uh, quantify uh, the uh, total stroke volume um, in the heart. So for this particular patient, we quantified a stroke volume of about 135 cc's and, he, and an ejection fraction of about 62%. Um, in terms of the reproducibility of, of this technique, it's uh, very reproducible. In, uh, in a, uh, a series of studies, it was shown that the coefficient of variation was well below 5%. And when we're talking about the quantification of ejection fractions, we're talking about uh, uh, variations of on, on the order of a plus or minus 2%. We can also use a technique called phase contrast flows, where we can actually encode uh, on a, a voxel by voxel level the uh, uh, amount of uh, velocity going through and uh, velocity times area. We again get we get um, uh, we get a flow uh, through that, and so we can actually quantify uh, aortic forward flow, pulmonary aortic uh, uh, pulmonary artery uh, uh, forward flow, and uh, does. Uh, quantify uh, QPQS and chunk fractures as well. For this particular patient, we got a forward flow of 70 cc's, and what's not going through the aortic valve must be going through the MR, uh, through the regurgitant jet, and so that we quantify that to be 65 cc's with a regurgitant fraction of about 48%. This has actually been incorporated in the latest 2017 guidelines that uh, uh, Dr. Zogby uh, chaired, and so when there is a question of the severity of MR, uh, this is uh, this is a modality that can be brought in alongside TEE to, for more accurate uh, quantification of the regurgitant severity. In terms of valvular stenosis, uh, we do acknowledge that uh, echo Doppler, uh, Doppler techniques uh, do have a, a better superior resolution in terms of picking up the peak velocities, but every now, um, but uh, not infrequently, cardiac MRI is brought in to weigh in and using a technique where we can adjust the parameters of the phase contrast. Uh, flow, we can see where aliasing disappears and does determine a relative peak velocity. In it. So in addition to uh, looking at the anatomic area of the stenotic valves, we can also look at the uh, peak velocity and uh, estimate uh, uh, a peak pressure gradient as well. Okay. But uh, moving on, uh, cardiac MRI has involved and, and introduced a new technique well, I should say not so new technique. This has been around for a couple of decades now. Uh, Dr. Raymond Kim and Robert Judd, when they were still at Northwestern, uh, did, did uh, very classic studies uh, where they took canine hearts, uh, uh, canine, and uh, gave them gadolinium contrast uh, after inducing a, an LED infarct, then uh, sacrificed these animals after doing cardiac MRI on them. Um, and as you can see in the right column and the uh, black and white, uh, you can see there's uh, there's a white indicating gadolin gadolinium retention. On the left column, you can see there's also, uh, there's, uh, and there's the uh, uh, histologic slides uh, that are stained for, for fi fibrotic tissue. And you can see this corresponds very nicely in a one-to-one -one fashion. They then went on the following year to demonstrate in patients that yes, indeed, they can see a myocardial infarction. So that's why we have a saying that in, in cardiac MRI, bright is dead. And, um, 
There was further studies uh, done on these patients too, where they showed that when you revascularize, revascularize these patients, uh, those who had transmural infarct, in other words, greater than 50% thickness involvement, um, there was uh, less chance of recovery of the contractility. So again, supporting the notion that uh, dead meat don't eat. This has been uh, expanded, so now we use it uh, for not only uh, assessment of viability in myocardial infarction, we also use it to look for different scar patterns. So we see classic scar patterns that are associated with myocarditis, with sarcoidosis. We also see a uh, um, hinge point a scar associated with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and RV pressure overload uh, as well. And of course, this is uh, when we see diffuse subendocardial enhancement all over the place, this has become pathognomonic and uh, diagnostic of uh, advanced cardiac amyloidosis. And so this is one of the preferred modalities for, for, uh, for determining that. This has also procedural implications. This allows us to help the interventional doctors when they're doing endomyocardial biopsies for tissue diagnosis to tell them, yeah, this particular region of the septum might be, might be more high yield, maybe you should go after that. Okay. Uh, expanding on the concept of delayed enhancement, we also um, uh, are, uh, help contribute with uh, the question of whether or not there's pericarditis. Uh, so this is a patient shown here with a constrictive pericarditis. And as you can see in the CINE, there's very, very uh, uh, increased thickening uh, that you can see, kind of like a rind around, around the heart. Um, and then in support of that, this is actively inflamed and, and uh, edematous and take, taking up and, and very leaky, uh, you can see in the, in the right-hand picture that this has diffuse enhancements shown as, here as bright white as well. Um, that's not to say that uh, uh, we uh, are just limited to, the, to uh, late ganglion enhancement. We can also do perfusion uh, alongside uh, um, the way nuclear stress testing done, is done. But we have the additional advantage of being able to see the thickness and extent of the ischemia as well, and shown here. Okay, um, but uh, what we can do is we can actually do, do what's uh, perfusion imaging where we inject a, a bolus of contrast and follow the uh, transition of contrast through the different chambers of the heart, through the myocardium, and, and what the, what the uh, cine was supposed to show you is that uh, different parts of the heart will then perfuse, and you can see in that particular case uh, a defect consistent with LAD ischemia. In other words, the anterior wall and the septal wall will be hypoperfused relative to, to the other, other walls. Uh, but uh, the other great strength about uh, cardiac MRI is that then we can also do tissue characterization. So uh, a big question that often comes, comes up is, uh, what is that cardiac mass? Or is that cardiac mass really a mass, or is it thrombus? So often we'll see uh, patients referred over for, for mass evaluation. And so shown here is this very nice example where you see this big uh, um, um, mass in the apex. And when we do late contrast inhibiting, it doesn't take up any contrast, uh, suggesting something that uh, is pretty ace. Uh, uh, pretty uh, uh, well organized, and then using um, the magnetic properties of the uh, of the tissue, um, such as T1 and T2, we demonstrate that uh, th this is actually a, a finding consistent with a big LV apical thrombus. So then this helps in terms of decision making and deciding whether or not you need to you put this patient on on antithrombotics, or uh, on the flip side, uh, refer this patient to your friendly heart surgeon for further evaluation, as well. The other uh, area that uh, cardiac MRI is very useful is in, in patients who are uh, sus uh, suspected of having cardiac iron overload. And so we, there is very well uh, published data demonstrating association between T2 star values, a um, magnetic uh, parameter uh, that can be measured in the heart, and the um, iron content of the heart. So uh, often these patients will be referred for cardiac iron overload assessment, and this has become very useful to our liver transplant patients because we find when these patients undergo transplant that then they uh, unmask this uh, cardiac iron overload state and are found to have a, a quote, post-transplant cardiomyopathy as well. There are certain barriers to doing cardiac MRI, so not everyone, uh, everyone is suitable for that. Um, there's some absolute um, contraindications, like if the patient is severely claustrophobic or they have a big body habitus. Uh, not everyone can to tolerate the tiny bore, uh, I should say tiny, but the small bore, 60 centimeter, 70 centimeter bore uh, of the magnet. Uh, patients who have magnetic, magnetic un unsafe devices should not undergo uh, these uh, scans for obvious reasons, although pacemakers and defibrillators uh, nowadays are okay and we accept any and all. 
hemodynamically unstable patients that should obviously not get these scans as well. There are some relative contraindications. So uh, every now and then we do get patients sent with a little dose of, of, uh, of uh, Ativan, a little benzodiazepine. Please don't do that because th this is a pretty active study. Uh, so for the 30, uh, for the, uh, 30, 45 minutes the patients are with us, they do have to be able to cooperate and do breath holds, otherwise it would be less uh, results in a uh, less than stellar study. And arrhythmia is, uh, is often a bane of our existence, but these two uh, we can work around. We can still work with the patient to try to get around them. For those who do need gadolinium contrast, it, um, obviously if they had a severe allergy to uh, gadolinium in the past, um, that should, that's an absolute contraindication. Those with uh, uh, low renal function, GFR less than 30, or acute renal fail failure should not uh, get uh, gadolinium either, but that, that doesn't mean we can't do the rest of the study, the morphologic assessment. Uh, but the reason for this is because there's a, a black box warning for nephrogenic systemic fibrosis uh, that was seen in the earlier generations, uh, generation of gadolinium contrast agents. And of course, uh, uh, patients who are pregnant should not get, uh, ideally should not get contrast uh, either, although they can, again, undergo morphologic assessment. So in summary, we can uh, provide very nice 3D data sets, infinite 2D scan planes to interrogate the cardiac structures uh, with a complete full views of anatomy. We can do volumetric and flow quantification for function, valvular, and shunt assessments. Uh, we can also do detection of myocardial scar or pericardial enhancements using late uh, contrast enhanced techniques. And last but not least, uh, we can contribute in terms of looking at the tissue characteristics of the heart and other, other surrounding um, uh, structures such as masses as well. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thanks.